So it's been over a month since the Israel-Hamas war began. Over 1,400 Israelis have died in the terror attack that happened on the 7th of October. There are still over 200 hostages. In response, Israel has launched a massive air and ground operations in which the Ministry of Health in Gaza says over 10,000 Palestinians have died. Where is this war headed? Are we likely to see any kind of an end game here from Israel's side? And what kind of impact is it having around the world, particularly in Western societies? We're seeing both pro-Palestinian protests in large numbers and also pro-Israel protests in large numbers. Joining me now is uh, one of the leading foreign policy voices in the world, international affairs commentator and the anchor of uh, Fareed Zakaria, GPS on CNN. Fareed Zakaria, thank you for speaking with us here on CNN News 18. Good to talk to you, Zaka. So let me start off by asking you, it's been over a month now since this war began between Israel and Hamas. Uh, I just listed out the casualties on both sides. What is your assessment of where things stand right now? And do you see any end in the near term to this or is this going to be a long war? I think this is going to be longer than most people would uh, would have hoped or wanted because uh, the Israelis have decided that they really need to do something much more fundamental than they have done in the past. You know, they've had, I think, five uh, previous uh, military incursions into Gaza, mostly uh, through aerial bombardment. But this time they've decided they cannot uh, live with a Hamas rule Gaza, which means you have to really go in and rooted out uh, in, in a very complicated, uh, grueling battle where you're going in urban warfare, you know, uh, house to house and things like that. Uh, the United States did this in Mosul. This is the closest analogy I can think of in Iraq. And it took nine months. Now, I don't think it'll take quite that long because the Israeli army is massive and powerful and right next door. The U.S. was, uh, you know, had only sent 150,000 troops in, uh, to Iraq. But it tells you, uh, you know, just how complicated the operation is. And there's one additional factor. The reason the Israelis are using this massive bombardment and even the massive artillery fire, which is leveling whole block blocks of the city uh, of Gaza, is, of course, they're trying to minimize casualties of Israeli soldiers. So if you think about it, you know, when you're confronting... Uh, the, the possibility of tunnels around hospitals or whatever it is, there would be a way to go in without destroying the entire neighborhood, which would be to send Israeli troops into those tunnels. But of course, that would presumably cause uh, a much, much greater danger to Israeli troops. So and this is the same dilemma the U.S. faced in Iraq. So, you know, how much do you bomb and how much are you willing to live with the civilian casualties are the result. And this is the calculation that is going to take place in each of these places. So I suspect this is going to be a long, bloody struggle and we're only in the middle of it. But, but as the civilian casualties mount and, and the Ministry of Health in Gaza is saying over 10,000 have died, a large number of them happen to be women and children. Uh, as the civilian casualties mount in, in the Gaza Strip, how much pressure is there going to be on Israel? Even with the Biden administration, how much pressure is the Biden administration facing? We've seen these you know, pro-Palestinian protests and we've seen even Jewish groups in America protest uh, against what they feel is some kind of a blank check given by the Biden administration to the Israeli government. At what point do those words translate into action in a way that Israel has to say, OK, we now have to respond to this international pressure? You know, when Israel has felt as threatened as it does now, um, very little international pressure in the past has mattered. First of all, the only pressure that matters is the pressure from Washington. Uh, Israel has kind of gotten used to the idea that it will be overwhelmingly outvoted in the UN. I think if you look at the, the UN General Assembly votes, it has been, you know, five to ten countries voting with Israel. Uh, everyone else, 170 countries voting against. But the only country that matters in this situation is the United States. The Biden administration has adopted a strategy where they are trying to be very supportive of Israel, particularly publicly, and privately caution them and, and warn them and rein them in. 
I would say, honestly, so far it has not worked uh, because the uh, Bibi Netanyahu has pocketed the, the support and is defying any kind of pressure. Uh, and he's uh, banking on the idea that at a moment like this, with Israel feeling as vulnerable, uh, that the Biden administration will not apply real pressure, uh, will not publicly break with them. Uh, and that's probably uh, a reasonable bet. Uh, the Biden administration counseled them not to even do a ground invasion, to do a more targeted set of incursions that would go after specific terrorists. They've cautioned them not to do the siege. I mean, I think the most questionable part of Israel's strategy here is they have laid siege to Gaza. No food, no electricity, no water, no medicines for 2.2 million people. Now, whatever you may think about hunting out the 30 or 40,000 Hamas militants uh, to lay siege to an entire population does seem very close to collective punishment. And the Biden administration counseled against that. We're not able to get anywhere. As I say, Israel is feeling a kind of existential uh, a threat. And when you feel as, uh, as threatened as that, you tend to lash out. You tend not to listen to, uh, to others. That's where they are now. I, 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 I don't think the Biden administration has any plans to massively ramp up the pressure. But they have certainly been making, making it known that their views are not in, in uh, you know, their views are in divergence with those of the of the uh, Netanyahu government. And across the Atlantic, we're seeing a bit of a, a, a political fallout, if you will. Uh, maybe not directly, but certainly indirectly because of this war. Uh, Suella Breverman, who is the, who used to be the UK Home Secretary, uh, she's been sacked. We now have the former. British Prime Minister David Cameron uh, back in government after seven years as the new Foreign Secretary of Britain. Uh, how do you weigh in on these changes? I, I think this is, uh, as you say, indirectly a result of all this. But there was always a split within the Tory party uh, between Rishi Sunak, who is seen as a kind of more moderate technocratic figure, and the hard right. Uh, and Suella Bregman really representing that hard right. So I suspect that uh, while Rishi Sunak has done, you know, what you have to do as prime minister, you cannot have a member of your cabinet openly defying you. Uh, I suspect Bregman is not so unhappy about this because her strategy presumably will be to uh, let Rishi Sunak t uh, participate in the, lead the party in the next elections, lose in that election, and then mount a challenge to him as the you know the true Tory, the true conservative, the hardline uh, figure, and this was a convenient issue on which to break. Uh, it was a it was kind of a silly issue, and she's frankly, I think, in the wrong here. Uh, the, the issue was whether or not to allow a, a demonstration. I mean, Britain is the mother of parliaments. It is the home of one of the oldest democracies in the world. Uh, freedom of speech and association are widely uh, protected. Of course, you don't want that to turn into intimidation and violence, but the argument that you can ban a, a demonstration that you know, hundreds of thousands of people wanted to take part in feels more like being in a, you know, an authoritarian country. Uh, you, know, you ban demonstrations in Russia, you don't ban them in Britain. Um, and the appointment of David Cameron now is, uh, as Foreign Secretary, uh, you say it'll be a more balanced, perhaps a more centrist uh, sort of approach. And, and clearly he's a weighty voice uh, and, and the world could do with more voices of heft, one would imagine, particularly as, as we have two wars happening almost in parallel. Yeah, Dave, David Cameron is a very uh, is a smart guy. He's a wise uh, person. He's also mellowed, I think. Uh, but he was always a moderate. Remember, he was he was against Brexit. And that's why he lost his uh, prime ministership. Uh, but uh, the truth of the matter is, even Britain, which is probably you know after the United States, the second country that that Israel would pay attention to, uh, it doesn't have that much influence. Britain has become a minor player. Uh, on the world stage, uh, particularly after Brexit. It has turned into, Great Britain has turned into Little England. 
because without the the uh, the association with Europe, you know, it is a relatively it's a medium sized power. Uh, it doesn't really have that much heft on its own, uh, and it has severed the connection with Europe. So it's not clear whether. David Cameron can reverse any of that just because of his sheer the sheer weight of his personality. Uh, I doubt it very much. I think Britain uh, is now playing in you know in the in the in the the little leagues of international relations. I, I want to focus uh, just for a moment on you know the kind of backlash we're seeing from both sides uh, to this war uh, in in Western societies in in Western cities in London in Paris in New York in American university campuses you're seeing both pro-Palestinian uh, protesters out and you're also seeing pro-Israel uh, protesters out a and many are also saying that you know some of the anti-semitic stuff that you're seeing is probably you know the highest that we've seen since the uh, since the Holocaust uh, what what is the impact this has had? And, and it's getting sort of mixed up in, you know, immigration politics, in, in the culture wars. How is this sort of playing out in, in Western societies, both on both sides of uh, the Atlantic, as it were? I, I think you're right, Zaka. It's, it's, uh, it's more heated than I can remember at any point in, in uh, certainly several decades. And I think that has to do with the fact that there is a, a, a newer, younger uh, group of, of voters and uh, participants in the, in the Western world who are more diverse, more multicultural, and don't instinctively support Israel as their older uh, cohorts would have. Uh, now, I think that some of that is the Israeli policies over the last uh, several decades. And it's important to really make a distinction here. You have had for the last 20 years, roughly, right-wing governments in Israel that have expanded settlements, uh, confiscated land from Palestinians, uh, jailed Palestinians. There has been settler violence against Palestinians that has gone unchecked. You have had a 16-year blockade of Gaza. And a certain amount of the uh, anti-Israel protesting is really anti these right-wing government policies in Israel. Uh, you know, if you go back 20 years when the, the, when the left was in power in Israel and they were trying to negotiate two-state solutions, I think that was a very different Israel in a sense. So some of it is directed not at the existence of Israel, but at those policies. But there is some that morphs into a kind of broader anti-Zionism and a broader anti-Israelism, which also sometimes morphs into anti-Semitism, and that is appalling and should be condemned. But I do think it's important to make that distinction between opposing specific policies of specific governments in Israel and, you know, opposing the existence of Israel or even worse, talking about the excessive power of Jews and things like that, which are, of course, age-old tropes and conspiracy theories that people have had forever. Um, but all of it is coming, kind of mixing together and is producing a pretty powerful uh, set of controversies uh, in the United States, in, 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 in Britain, in, in much of Europe. So let me uh, end by, you know, coming back to where I started. Uh, right now, there is this intense war that's going on. Uh, it doesn't seem like uh, Israel is going to relent anytime soon. Well, what happens three months from now? What happens six months from now? At what point does Israel say, okay, we have achieved uh, whatever military objective we started out uh, at, at the beginning of this war? Uh, and what happens the day after the war? I mean, what, what replaces Hamas, for example? These are very good questions, Zaka. And unfortunately, so far, listening to uh, Israeli officials, you don't get the sense that they have thought this through very well. So to begin with, what would constitute success? It's not clear because you, I mean, you, you can root out Hamas in certain neighborhoods and go into some tunnels and get them out, but then are you sure they're not nowhere else? Are you sure they haven't, the leaders haven't uh, crossed the border into Egypt, into, into Lebanon? Uh, nobody knows for sure. So there will have to be some judgment used as, at, at some point to say, we are now sure that we have gotten most of the military hardware and architecture uh, out. But then, as you say, the real question is, 
What happens then? What the United States learned in Iraq and Afghanistan is once you destroy the existing authority, the problem becomes you need to replace it with some kind of authority. And that authority will be challenged. So the issue is not just whom do you put in place to rule Gaza, but the issue is whom do you put in place in Gaza who will be able to withstand the inevitable challenges to its authority. Let's say you put in place you know, the Palestinian Authority, as people are often talking about. Um, well, there will be terror attacks against the Palestinian Authority lodged by Hamas and Islamic Jihad. You put in the Arab League or an Arab coalition of Arab states, same thing. You put in the UN. The United States tried doing the UN in Iraq, and the first bombings were of uh, UN headquarters, you know, killing dozens, including the leader of that mission. So how do you manage to achieve stability and order I suspect that Israel is going to have to effectively reoccupy Gaza for some extended period of time, uh, which will be a very time-consuming and taxing enterprise, and will involve more civilian casualties, uh, and will look, you know, will will degrade Israel's legitimacy in the world even more. Uh, they really have not thought this through, and I think that the uh, the prospect of a kind of clean and easy victory uh, is not very high. All right. Uh, we'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, Fareed Zakari. It's always a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you for your time and for your insights. Good to talk to you, Zakari.